Good morning, Pennington. My name is Vivian, and our scripture reading for today is from Hebrews chapter 7, verses 11 to 17, reading from the ESV. Now, if perfection had been attainable through the Levitical priesthood, for under it the people received the law, what further need would there have been for another priest to rise after the order of Melchizedek, rather than one named after the order of Aaron? For when there is a change in the priesthood, there is necessarily a change in the law as well. For the one of whom these things are spoken belong to another tribe, from which no one has ever served at the altar. For it is evident that our Lord was descended from Judah, and in connection with that tribe, Moses said nothing about priests. This becomes even more evident when another priest arises in the likeness of Melchizedek who has become a priest, not, not on the basis of a legal requirement concerning bodily descent, but by the power of an indestructible life. For it is witness of him, you are a priest forever, after the order of Melchizedek. This is the word of the Lord. Thank you, Vivian. I've uh, been loving our church members' reading of Scripture, and again, a reminder that this is a communal process that we are working in together. I just happen to be gifted and called to teach from the stage, but we are all together studying the book of Hebrews. We are all together pressing in to Jesus. I've been starting uh, each of these sermons with some Bible jokes. Rachel, last week, um, gave you a gracious pause from it. I'm going to just continue that for this week. I'm, I think they'll come back fresher next week if we take a pause from it. But I do want to play off of the Hebrews we've been talking about. How does Moses make his coffee? He brews it. That's correct. Um, I want to talk a little bit about coffee, actually, instead of jokes. Um, yep. I, I grew up, I didn't drink coffee until I was uh, actually a pastor. And in our movement, um, there's not a lot of people that drink alcohol. So for us, it's caffeine. And if you're meeting with another pastor, it's, you want to go to Starbucks, you want to get coffee, you want to go out here. And so I was like, I don't drink coffee, but this seems to be what people do. And I started, do you know what my, my gateway was? A Starbucks mocha chip frappuccino, because it's barely coffee, right? It's barely coffee, but that was my first step into it. Um, now I get all these like single origin coffees shipped to me around the world, and if it's less fresh than two weeks, it's garbage to me. And then I make it in my espresso machine, and I have a whole thing where I'm reading my pressure limits. But I was actually thinking about this sermon series and thinking about the Hebrews joke. And in our home, I have made coffee and it evolved in five different stages of how I brew my coffee. The first was simply a Mr. Coffee gravity-fed coffee pot where, you know, you plug it in and it comes in a little basket, makes your pot of coffee. Then I moved on to a mocha pot after I traveled to Italy and I, was, I saw all these little Italian guys making their little mocha pots and selling it. I bought one and then I made coffee that way. It's a tiny, it looks like a tiny little pot you put on your stove, pressure comes up and you make a tiny espresso from it. Then I moved on to a French press. I bought one from Ikea for like $7 made of glass. I shattered it by pressing down once. Like you make the coffee, it's like a reverse of a normal coffee. So the, the grinds are in the bottom and then you fill it up with water, you let it steep and then you push a plunger down that filters it. And it got stuck once and I was pressing it down and it got stuck, it released and I literally smashed it down into pieces by my hand. Hot coffee went everywhere, glass went everywhere and I did not cut myself, it was crazy. So I moved on from the French press at that point. Um, I then moved into an aero press, which is really next level and I only use on vacation. And it's this like reverse thing, it looks like a syringe and you like plunge the coffee through it. And then finally, the ultimate evolution, we have our own espresso machine that our family came together for one Christmas and bought for us. And so now I make all these little fancy coffees and we are even those people who make our own syrups at home and the house smells delicious, but we have them in little jars. All the pretension you could possibly imagine about coffee. We have walked down that avenue. But I still also will just drink a coffee out of a gas station and a little cup. I'm both pretentious and incredibly not when it comes to coffee. I just I just love the ritual of it. In the cup, the hot liquid, drinking it, I love all that comes with it. 
Each version of making coffee for me was, I wasn't disappointed with the previous, but I just felt like there's got to be better. There's got to be a better way to do it. There's got to be a better way. So I had to take the good I was enjoying and move into that next level. Throughout the book of Hebrews, the pastor is writing to us, what you may be experiencing in your spiritual life right now may be good. It may be a good experience of what you have with Jesus, of how you're understanding God, but he's encouraging them, there is better. There's a better way. You can move to that next step, that next experience. In Hebrews chapter 7, kind of the middle of this book, as we look at Melchizedek, He's talking about a priesthood, which the readers, the early Christians who were also Jewish would have understood, this is the old way that we did our faith, through the priests. This was a system that worked for us mostly, and he's saying, but no, there is now a better way in Christ Jesus. Let's give the background on Hebrews. We've been doing this each week. In short, Hebrews is a letter written by an early pastor to Jewish Christians who were experiencing intense persecution. And his encouragement to them is, while there's a lot of pressure on you, don't give up on Jesus. He is not the cause of your problems. He's the solution to your problems. He is so very powerful and so very compassionate to you. So cling to him in your time of need. We are not suffering external persecution in the same way that the intended audience of this letter was, but we got our stuff. You have your stuff. I have my stuff. We're still suffering through this world because we are still human beings living in a fallen, broken world. And as such, we can still take that better step into the presence of Jesus to receive his power and his compassion. Now, today we are specifically diving into Melchizedek. Now, by just a show of, just give me like a little yell out there or an amen, how many of you know very little about Melchizedek? Yeah, okay, all right. You're also like a little embarrassed to say it because it feels like you should. I'm going to tell you, as somebody professionally trained and studied in studying Scripture, you should not know a ton about Melchizedek until you get to Hebrews. He does not appear a lot in the Old Testament. He really makes his triumphant, elevated status in this letter. If you ask the question, who is Melchizedek? Very normal question. Why talk about Melchizedek? Very good question. What does this random Old Testament figure have to do with the glory and goodness of Jesus? More specifically, how can knowing about this man help me today with my very present struggles and suffering and questions? Well, we're going to explore that this morning. Melchizedek first comes about in Genesis chapter 14. Genesis 14, verses 18 through 20. This is the one main narrative portion we have about who Melchizedek was, starting in verse 18. And Melchizedek, king of Salem, brought out bread and wine. He was priest of God Most High. And he blessed him, he's blessing Abraham, and said, Blessed be Abram by God Most High, possessor of heaven and earth. And blessed be God Most High, who has delivered your enemies into your hand. And Abram gave him a tenth of everything. That's it. There's a lot in here that's strange. Abram and Genesis 14, we are early in the biblical story. We are early even in Abram's story who becomes Abraham. We haven't yet had the full promises, the full covenant to God from God to Abraham. We haven't even yet had his name changed. We haven't yet had his children born or any of that stuff that goes on with Isaac. We haven't had any of that. What we have is Abram called by God to this land. And the story is, is a weird little nuance. His nephew Lot who comes with him gets captured and Abram goes with his servants and brings them all together and God blesses them and they're able to destroy multiple kings in one big battle. Abraham has this dominant route. He comes back and then he interacts with this random guy, Melchizedek, who all it tells us is he was king and he was a priest. And then Abraham submits under this man and that's it. 
And the story goes on. We never hear about Melchizedek again in the Old Testament. One other passage happens about Melchizedek again. And if it's one of those quiz questions, if you can guess where one more time his name comes up, you get a thousand points in your Bible quiz. It's Psalm chapter 110. In one verse, it talks about Melchizedek. In the order of Melchizedek, you are a priest, it says. And that's it in the Old Testament. The only time he begins to come back is in the New Testament. In Acts chapter 2, Peter mentions Psalm 110. And in it, he talks about being a priest in the order of Melchizedek. He talks about the passage in the beginning of Psalm 110, where my Lord says to my Lord, and he talks about this couldn't be about David. This psalm couldn't be about him because who's the Lord of David? Who's he talking to? This must be a psalm about Jesus. Now, the author of Hebrews takes that idea and runs with it. It's also the part that reminds me this is probably a pastor writing a sermon to his people because I do stuff like this all the time. I'm trying to illustrate a point. I'm like, how do I illustrate the point best? Oh yeah, that one story. I'm going to take that story. I'm going to blow it up and I'm going to tell it really long and I'm going to explain it to get the picture in. This is what the author is doing. This is what the pastor is doing with Melchizedek. Let's see what he says in Melchizedek. Hebrews chapter 7, verses 1 through 3. This is the Hebrews' understanding of Melchizedek. For this Melchizedek, king of Salem, priest of the Most High God, met Abraham returning from the slaughter of the kings and blessed him. And to him, Abraham appointed a tenth part of everything. This is, we know this already, we just read that. Now he begins to kind of explain it more, preach it. He is first by translation of his name, king of righteousness. This is what his name meant. And then he is also king of Salem, and Salem meant peace. So he's king of righteousness and king of peace. He is without father or mother or genealogy. It doesn't mention where he came from, who his family is. Having neither beginning of days nor end of life, but resembling the Son of God, he continues a priest forever. Now, verse 3 is really where the author of Hebrews takes some poetic license and takes an interpretation and runs with it. Because we don't know much about Melchizedek in the passage, doesn't mention parents, doesn't mention children, where he came from. The author says, well, then he didn't have parents, and he didn't have children, he didn't have siblings. He comes out of nowhere, has no lineage. So then he makes a jump and says, so he exists forever. Is that really what the passage said? It's what the author of Hebrews is interpreting and the Holy Spirit leading him in order to understand Jesus. We're understanding Melchizedek didn't need authority of family, didn't need lineage, didn't need these explanations. His authority was intrinsic in who he was. So what do we know about Melchizedek from the author of Hebrews in this passage? We know five things. We know that Melchizedek is a metaphor for Jesus. That's apparent. uh, Melchizedek is mentioned four times in the Old Testament. He's mentioned ten times in Hebrews. We see him all throughout this passage specifically as a way to understand Jesus. Number two, he was a king and a priest of Salem. Had those two roles. This is actually common in the ancient Near East, that a king would also have a religious function. Not only am I the most powerful person, but God has appointed me and I can help you understand God. But what we do know in the Old Testament, that is not how the Israelites functioned. They were separate roles in the Old Testament. Number three, the name means both righteousness and peace. Number four, he received a tithe and gave a blessing to Abraham. So it meant Abraham recognized his authority over him. And then fifth, he has no family. These are the things we know. This is what the author is telling us in the beginning about Melchizedek. So what is the point the author's trying to make in Hebrews chapter 7? First, we need to understand as we talk about Melchizedek, as we talk about priests, as we talk about Jesus, he's writing to Jewish Christians who had a strong understanding of something called the priesthood, of men who would be intermediaries or go-betweens between God and humans. Not priests as we understand Catholic priests, although they serve a somewhat similar function, but ancient priests who you would bring an offering to 
and they would give that offering to God. So they grew up, the people reading this letter, the Christians reading it, grew up with this system. They grew up knowing that every once in a while, my family and I, we would travel to the temple, we would take a journey to Jerusalem, and we would bring with us a really adorable lamb or some doves that we had or a goat. We would bring it with us, and then we'd give it to this priest who would then offer it to God because they understood God is holy. He's righteous, and he's perfect, and he's powerful. I am human. I am flawed broken, made from dust. And so I can't, I'm scared to make that journey between me and God. I'm I'm not clean enough. I'm not good enough. I'm not righteous enough. So God graciously placed this role of men who would be the go-between between me and God. They would make this offering. That offering would cleanse me and my family so that we could go back to our lives for a little while knowing, okay, we have a right relationship with God. The problem is it didn't last. I'd have to come back again and come back again and come back again. And so we see the author of Hebrews taking this idea of religion. We're humans. God is holy. I'm flawed, so I have to pay the penalty of my sin. And these priests help me to do that. They're go-betweens. So he's pointing out kind of this was a good thing that was helpful for us, but also he's pointing out the flawed nature of it, why it didn't totally work and why it's limited. We see this now in Hebrews chapter 7, verses 15 through 19. We'll come back to our friend Melchizedek. You can call him Mel if you want. In verse 15, this becomes even more evident when another priest arises in the likeliness, in the likeness of Melchizedek, who has become a priest not on the basis of a legal requirement concerning bodily descent, but by the power of an indestructible life. For it is a witness of him, you are a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. For on the one hand, a former commandment is set aside because of its weakness and uselessness, for the law made nothing perfect. But on the other hand, a better hope is introduced, through which we may draw near to God. He's saying that system that you held on to, it was broken and it was limited. And we're going to see how in Christ Jesus, it is not limited and it is not broken anymore. Here's part of the problem that he's laying out with the priestly system. God made himself known to the world through a particular group of people. We understand that term as election. He chose people to reveal himself to the world. Those people are the Israelites, the family of Abraham. By these people, I will tell the world about my character. But God is so holy that even in those people, he needed more elected people in order to make atonement for them. And then in those people, they needed one person, the high priest, to even make them more elect and holy. And you may begin to see the problem. The problem is God's revealing himself to humans through an imperfect system of humans. And so I make atonement through a priest who makes atonement to God through his own offerings, but I'm making my offering to a priest and they're human. We have a tendency to read Old Testament figures through Shakespearean perfection, but they're humans and they would do what you would do. They would say, I'm giving my offering to this priest, but how holy is this guy? Can he really make the offering the way I need it to be made? Is his life perfect? Because I've heard stories about priests before, and I've heard stories about their own righteousness. So can they really make atonement for me? Because how perfect or good is this guy? Not only that, but this guy is human. He's going to die. And you can even form a relationship with your priest. You've known him for 30 or 40 years. Grandma came to this priest and then he dies. His son's coming in or other priests are now coming in. You're going, well, I knew that guy was trustworthy. I know nothing about this guy. And we have in the Old Testament story after story of the next generation, next generation being more flawed, being more sinful, not doing it quite the right way. So God has given you this way to be made right with him but it's a flawed way. So you always have in the back of your mind, is this really working? Am I really forgiven? 
Is this enough? Is, are they making atonement enough? I got to keep going to the priest because I keep sinning. I've looked at myself in the mirror and I've said, stop it. But I keep doing it. So I still need to keep coming to these priests. But these priests are flawed and they have to keep making atonement for themselves. And it feels sort of like this Russian nesting doll of people making offerings for sin. So what does it look like then? We have a picture. This is the old system. This is how it works. There's a line of Aaron. These are the people who are priests. God selected them, and so they're priests because of their family lineage, because of who they are, they're priests. They can be a priest because their great, 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 great grandfather was Aaron, and they can track themselves through the tribe of Levi, and so that's what makes them a priest. But they're also a human, so they're sinful and flawed, and they're doing kind of the best that they can, but it's not quite enough. They take my sin and they pile their sin together and they offer it to God. That's the system. It kind of works, kind of doesn't work. Like you've ever been trying to drag out a car that you know is a beater and it's running on its last legs and you're like, it gets me to where I need to go most of the time. So I kind of just put up with it. This is where the priesthood is feeling. It's a cycle of forgiveness and also a cycle of guilt. So you feel forgiven, but then it also reminds you, I got to come back here again in a few months. It reminds you again, I'm not quite, I, I'm not holy. I'm, I'm not always so sure that my relationship with God is secure. There's too many variables in between. Have I done the sacrifices the right way? Did my kids sin and I didn't know it, so I forgot to mention that? Is the priest making the right offerings? Is their life right? So we're never totally sure, and it's always in the back of our minds, this forgiveness and guilt cycle. Now, we live in the 21st century, and we're very enlightened people. And how many of you have, in a church service, brought a sheep with you to be slaughtered in the front of the church? No? Nobody? Yeah, we don't have this system anymore, but we'd be kidding ourselves to say we don't also struggle with this idea of guilt and forgiveness and a cycle of, yeah, I feel forgiven. Tuesday, I don't quite feel so forgiven. I don't know if I prayed enough at church or, you know, Rachel was preaching last week and, and I don't know if I, I, if I caught every part of it. Maybe I need to watch it again or I need to pray again. We start to feel this cycle ourselves. And when you can say, well, I don't have a priesthood to go between me and God. I don't have that, so I'm good. But I'll challenge you of how you think of your faith and what we lean on to. We often in the modern day, we do still look to others as our medium between God and us. I'll give you some examples. The pastors in our lives. Well, I need pastor to explain this scripture, otherwise I don't, I don't know how it works. Or I need an elder or a pastor to pray over me, otherwise I don't feel like God is moving or going to answer. I'm in a time of struggling, I'm going through a disease, or I'm in the hospital, and if pastor doesn't come and lay hands on me and pray, I'm not sure if God is going to respond and move in that. We do this with our spouses. Tim and Kathy Keller wrote the best book ever on this meaning of marriage. And what they say is, in the modern construction, we look to our future spouse to be our savior or the means by which we can be a savior. I'm going to be that white knight and I'm going to rescue that person and they're going to need me and I'm going to answer everything. Or my life is broken and flawed until I find that right person. And what we're doing is we're asking another person to be a savior and they can't. And then either we crush them with the weight of it or we become embittered and disappointed that they're not quite enough. I'm not quite enough. We got married. I still feel not right. I still don't feel whole because that person isn't your savior. We do it with our children. I didn't make the soccer team, so I'm going to 
beat my kid into every practice he's going to so he can be captain of the soccer team. I didn't get into the Ivy League school, so you better believe my kid's going to be at piano, every study hall, SAT prep classes. They're going to go to Pennington Prep. They're going to get into the right schools because I didn't, and I will be saved because my children are going to achieve it. We even do this with influencers. Years ago, a church member said to me, it was after the Tiger Woods incident, right? Very famously, Tiger Woods, perhaps one of the greatest golfers of all time. You could debate that with Jack Nicholson. And he has this breakdown in his life. Very publicly, his wife is attacking him with a golf club in his car. And then all comes out, all of these struggles with sexual addiction that he had. At the same time, there was a show on called John and Kate Plus Eight. Have you ever watched that? The Goslings? I always thought that it was crazy. And it broke apart. They got divorced. The husband was cheating on her. All these things fell apart. I remember one church member said to me, they said, first Tiger Woods and now John Goslin. I don't know who to believe in anymore. And I said, can I just politely point you to maybe you're believing in the wrong type of people? Uh, if you want to learn how to golf, look to Tiger Woods. I don't know about your like, center of morality and ethics. But we do this. We put our hope into a person and an ideal, hoping that person's going to get it right. And if they can get it right, then maybe I have a chance. And every time there's a moral failure, every time there's a breakdown, every time they end up back in rehab or a marriage falls apart, we lose a bit of our own belief in the goodness of life and humanity. We do. We'd like to say we don't, but we do. I do this myself with other pastors, church models, leaders, denominational leadership. I like to think I'm just learning things from them, but I admit in my heart that I'm often putting my hope into them. That last pastor didn't get it right, but this guy, he's going to have the right model. She's going to teach me the perfect theology that now I can sit under and now I have it right. I can tell you I've changed that with theologians and pastors and church models dozens of times in my life. And I've had to understand and heal that people I've looked to for salvation in church model, life ethic, pastoral theology are also flawed human beings like me. These people we often seek to know God by, and for you it very well may be me, or you're watching me preach this, and it could be me, we are flawed ourselves. And we are nobody's savior. We are the priesthood of encouraging one another. As Peter called us, we are the priesthood of all believers. We're encouraging each other. We're, atone, we're, we're praying for each other. We're working through scripture together, but we are not the savior to look for. Some of us, if we are honest, are putting way too much pressure and way too much weight onto other human beings. If you find yourself really embittered by a human being who let you down, I'm going to give you a piece of advice for you, not them. Take that weight off of them and let yourself be free of that anger and unforgiveness. Know that they are a flawed, sinful human being like you, doing their best, hopefully, to live in God's model, but are broken. Hebrews chapter 7, continuing in verse 27, talks to us now about who we can put our trust into. It says, Jesus, he has no need, like those high priests, to offer sacrifices daily, first for our own sins and then for the sins of others, since he did this once and for all when he offered up himself. For the law appoints men in their weakness as high priests, but the word of the oath, which came later than the law, appoints a son who has been made perfect forever. God appoints weak men and women as go-betweens because we need it. But he says, but now you have a strong go-between in Christ Jesus. So let's see what the solution is, what the author of Hebrews is offering us. And hopefully we'll get another cute graphic we can look at. Let's look back to Hebrews 7.22. This makes Jesus the guarantor of a better covenant. The former priests were many in number because they were prevented by death from continuing in office. We need a lot of priests because they keep dying. That's what he's saying. 
but he holds his priesthood permanently because he continues forever, because Christ Jesus has resurrected and will never die. Consequently, he is able to save to the utmost those who draw near to God through him, since he always lives to make intercession for them. Why Melchizedek? How do we understand Jesus better by Melchizedek? By taking those character traits and seeing them as the metaphor of how to understand Jesus. Let's look now at the priesthood in Melchizedek. The line of Melchizedek is not a real line. It's not human born from another human so they have the right and, you know, Queen Elizabeth died and now we have Charles. He's doing a thing. I don't know. And we have, we have to. It's, 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 her, it's her son. We got to do it. And then his son and they're after them. It says, no, the line of Melchizedek is a line where God empowers them because of the very nature of who they are. Not because they're from a line of others, but because the very nature and character of who they are. Christ Jesus doesn't need to be born of the tribe of Levi. He even says, it may confuse you because he's the line of Judah, which is not the same tribe as Levi. But it doesn't matter in Christ Jesus because of the inherent nature of the character of who Christ Jesus is. He can show up on the scene without having parent lineage because his nature is perfect. His nature is king and high priest. It's inherent in who he is. He is both king and priest, a major theme of this letter. He has all the power and authority. Christ Jesus can tell us what to do and have the right direction and right message. And if you've ever struggled to see Christ challenge you, just go back and read the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew chapter five through seven and watch it rip us apart as Christ says, you think this is how power works? No, it's this way. You think you've done well enough? No, you haven't. Look at my example in my life. Christ Jesus has the authority as king. And then he also has the compassionate hand as priest. He says, I have all the power, but I am your mediator between God the Father and you. And because I have resurrected, I'm not going anywhere. I will be here and I will be here forever and I will make atonement forever. And you don't have to worry like the priests before you or the pastor on YouTube or the person you've read. You do not have to worry that one day you're gonna open up your news feed and oh, they actually were doing this and oh, they stole money and now what am I gonna do? In Christ Jesus, we will always and forever read good upon good and glory upon glory and love upon love. It is the character of who he is. And so if I want to understand God the Father, it says I can confidently hold to Jesus because I will only ever discover his goodness and grace. And all else may let us down, he never will. He is the ultimate priest and king. He is flawless and he is eternal. The word in chapter 7, verses 11, 19, gets translated as perfection, that Christ Jesus is perfection and we receive perfection in him. That's a little hard to understand and maybe not the best translation. Scholars say that maybe the better translation is complete, that there is completeness in Christ Jesus, that in him the work was completed and the work was done. In him, everything was fulfilled that needed to be fulfilled. And in him, we can find completeness for that area of life that keeps nagging in the back of my brain, in the back of my heart, in the depth of my gut, saying, I'm not enough. I'm not worthy enough of love. I'm not valuable enough. I'm not perfect enough. That in Christ Jesus, he completes that and says, you are worthy of love. You are highly valued. You are good in me and by me and with me forever. And this is where the better comes in. If you want to learn how to make better coffee, I will gladly just spend an afternoon with you and I'll teach you. I would love to do it. And you will, by the end, not love it anymore. But (laughs) just being honest, it's it's a whole thing. In Christ Jesus, there is always better. There's always better. 
There's always more. There's always more to receive. There's always more of his grace. There's always more of his love. There's always more of his goodness. And the author of Hebrews is constantly saying to both the church 2,000 years ago and to us today, he's saying, don't settle for the thing that's just kind of working. Press in more. Jesus Christ is not just eternal, but he's limitless. You can always go deeper. You can always receive more. You can always be more warmly embraced, more completed by his presence and his goodness. We come to church on a Sunday morning and we dress maybe a little nicer than we normally do and we smile more big and we shake hands more confidently than maybe we do in the rest of our life, but we're all bringing in aspects of this world that are broken and incomplete. We are. We're coming in. We're all broken. I hear this all the time from new Christians or people exploring faith that they're like, yeah, I want to commit in. I want to go through growth track or I want to go to a small group. I just got to fix some stuff first. I'm not quite like that person or this person yet. And I'm like, oh, really? You want me to tell you about that person? And then I tell them all the sins of each of you in the room. And then they feel a lot better. But we come into this room thinking everybody else has it together and we're the only one on a Sunday morning bringing in these doubts about a doctor diagnosis. The only one here coming in with guilt and shame from our life from the last week or month. We're the only one coming in still trying to figure out how to deal with the relationship with our father. No, we are all bringing that into the room. And each of us has the opportunity to bring that incompleteness that the Bible would call sin or brokenness. We have the opportunity to bring it into Christ, the only one who can perfect and complete and heal the brokenness we're bringing into the room. The limits that we experience in our human relationships do not experience, do not exist in our relationship with Christ Jesus. I'll say this from experience. Some of us in the room today, very real, need to forgive a human being that we have put Christ-sized expectations on. That's a real opportunity for many of us. I have expected someone to be my savior and they weren't, and I'm still mad about it, I'm going to tell you today to find the forgiveness and freedom in Christ to let that go, to forgive that person. And maybe that person is you yourself. You expected to be your own savior. I can do this. Stiff upper lip. Grab my bootstraps. I can pull myself up. And you couldn't, and you're still upset about it. I'm in my 40s now, and I thought I would have achieved X, Y, and I haven't. Allow the Holy Spirit to speak into you your value that you are perfect in Christ Jesus. We need to let Jesus at the same time strip away the human experiences we have placed onto God. I think about the early Christians who experienced the priesthood and you come into the priesthood. If you've ever read the Old Testament, there are many priests who did many terrible things. And you think about coming in and saying, well, I used to believe in this system, but it's broken, and so I'm giving up on it. We do this all the time now. We call it a fancy term of deconstruction that the people who taught me about Jesus, the people who taught me about God, I now see their life and they're not living in a way that I think is very loving or shows that they believe that God is powerful and good and I learned about it from them. So I'm done with it. I don't want a God that people like that serve. Maybe you're still very real wrestling with the faith of your parents or the relationship with your parents. And when scripture uses God as father, that's a hard term, a hard pronoun for you to see God through or maybe a pastor or a church or a friend has let you down. And I wanna tell you today very clearly, that was not Jesus. That was a flawed human being that you need to forgive. And I'll say on behalf of pastors, on behalf of someone who works in the institution of church, many of you have very real gripes and hurts that weren't your fault. And on behalf of all of them, I am sorry. 
I am sorry that the church is run by flawed human beings. But we need to strip aside those hurts and those expectations to discover the very real Jesus behind it who is speaking to us of his eternal glory and power and inviting us to experience how very real and good he is. Jesus, as he describes himself, is gentle and lowly. Jesus, as Paul in Colossians describes, is powerful and mighty. Jesus, as Hebrews 7 describes, is capable of is eternal and is welcoming you into the presence of God. The last thing, and I think this is beautiful, is when we think of human beings and we think of church, it, we fall into this category of, well, I'm this denomination or I'm part, of, I'm part of PAG in 2022 and this is our vision and this is how we operate my grandparents went to this church and followed this teacher and my kids are going here. But if it's Christ Jesus, he bonds us together across space and time. That the generations before us sought Jesus, we seek Jesus. And hopefully, as we pray and long, the generations after us will seek Jesus. And it's not an idea that binds us, it's a person that makes us connected now and forever. We're praying to the same person, holding the same truth in him, bringing it to the Father and bringing the Father's love to us. And when I pray, I can think about the generations before me that also prayed to Jesus and he heard it and he can bring that to me as well. And he can bring our prayers to the next generations across the globe, across cultures, across ethnicity, across economics, that Jesus is the great binder and unifier of us all. And he gives us each an opportunity to come and receive the love of God through him, our great high priest and king. Not because of the lineage he comes from, because of the very nature of who he is. If you'll bow your heads with me this morning. I want to give an opportunity. Scripture says that there is a moment our faith journey begins. It begins, as Paul says, by confessing with our mouth and believing in our heart that Christ Jesus is Savior. We will be saved. He will come in. He will have fellowship with us. I want to give you a chance to take that first step of that starting point. If you don't recognize yourself as a follower of Jesus, I want to give you a chance to pray this prayer and let it be your first step towards life in Christ Jesus, your first step towards completeness in the presence and power of God. If you are a follower of Jesus, use this as a moment to recommit into that relationship. Pray this with me. Jesus, in this moment, I believe in you. I believe in the goodness of who you are that you are a great high priest and king in the order of Melchizedek. The very nature of who you are brings the relationship with God, forgiveness and love. Jesus, I believe that you were God and you put on flesh and you lived as man and God, that you taught and lived a perfect life. And then you died a sinner's death on a cross for my sin, my brokenness, my flawed nature. You were buried in the ground, and on the third day, you raised to life, resurrected, conquering death. You gave your life for me. Today, I commit my life to you. In the name of Jesus, amen. If you prayed that prayer for the first time, any of us on staff would love to pray with you and celebrate with you. If you prayed that online, just let us know in the comments or click that link there, and we would love to walk that journey with you. All across the room, if you can, if you'll stand with me as we close out. I want to give you a moment this morning, just a very tangible, physical demonstration of what we're talking about. That in Christ Jesus, we have what is better, and we are called deeper into that relationship with God.
we come into this room feeling like I'm not worthy maybe of God's love. I don't fully understand how God works and moves in my life. But that in Christ Jesus, he is the great go-between by which we know and experience the love of God. And as the author of Hebrews says, we are called to experience that now and forevermore. That power in Christ Jesus, that love is accessible right now, right here in this room. As you drive home, as you go to school or go to work, as you have dinner, it is accessible at all times because his spirit is alive and moving in us. And I want to give you a chance just as a physical demonstration this morning. These altars will be open. This space up here in front of the stage will be open. And if you this morning want to say, Jesus, I want more of you in my life. I want to experience more and better of who you are. And feel that presence of Christ envelop you and speak to you. The stage area is open and invite the presence of God in. Take a step forward, lift our hands as the team leads. Let's invite the presence of God into us this morning.